Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kilwan Lee. I will be the host for the sixth international conference on the law of the sea. It is my great pleasure to be here with you. I truly welcome all of our participants. First, I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude for joining us today at this international hybrid conference. Thank you. The video we're seeing together presents the historical evolution uh, of the law of the sea. Before we begin, I'd like to inform you that this conference will be held in hybrid format. As some of our participants are joining us online from overseas, I kindly ask for your understanding on any interruption associated with technical issues. Now, we will begin the conference under the title of the Law of the Sea for the Next Generation, Challenges from New Technologies and Environmental Crisis. To begin this conference, we are pleased to have President Albert Hoffman from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea to deliver the congratulatory remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Hoffman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Professor Kun Guan Li, President of the Korean Society of International Law, Mr. Ja Yong Ri, Director General for International Legal Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues and guests. It is an honor for me to provide some remarks at the opening of this, the sixth International Conference on the Law of the Sea hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea and co-organized by the Korean Society of International Law and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Since the first conference in 2016, members of the tribunal have each year contributed to and greatly benefited from the exchange of ideas on current issues in the law of the sea. I wish to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Korean Society of International Law for their initiative in organizing this event under, and I must, must say, challenging circumstances and for bringing together a distinguished group of experts to discuss the, challenging, the challenges facing the law of the sea today. It is a particular pleasure to be here in person after a long period when international Travel has not been possible, although, of course, there are still many restrictions in place worldwide, also with regard to traveling, as we have seen recently as well, which prevented some of you from joining us here in Incheon, Korea. We, never, we nevertheless look forward uh, to your contributions. For those of you who are attending in person, I look forward to discussions during the coffee breaks and some of, on some of the many interesting topics in the conference program. The topic of this year's co uh, conference, Law of the Sea for the Next Generation, with its focus on major challenges in ocean governance, including environmental crises and those relating to new technologies, could not be more timely. The level of international attention being given to the protection of the environment is unprecedented and the growing momentum around the climate justice movement and efforts to mitigate climate change is undeniable. The recent COP26 summit provided a focal point for discussion of many aspects of climate change, although it would seem that the effect of climate change on the oceans and the role of the oceans in climate change mitigation was not a key issue at the negotiations. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, along with the Paris Convention and the Kyoto Protocol, are the primary international in uh, law instruments through which states are seeking to address climate change, with a particular focus on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. However, they are certainly not the only relevant legal framework. 
Increasing attention is being paid to other international legal instruments, including the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The next generation of legal scholars are examining how legal proceedings under the existing international law framework, such as advisory opinion, opinions from the tribunal or the International Court of Justice, or petitions before international human rights bodies and regional human rights courts can contribute to efforts to mitigate climate change. However, the focus on the Convention in the context of climate change mitigation has not been, ex not been exclusively procedural. In terms of the substantive law of the sea, the question has been raised as to whether the obligations of states under the Convention are significant for climate change mitigation. It has now been nearly 40 years since the Convention was adopted in 1982. At that time, scientific consensus on the effect of human activity on the global climate and the relationship between CO2 levels and temperature was only beginning to emerge. Issues such as sea level rise and ocean acidification as a result of global warming might not have been the preoccupation of delegates during the third uh, United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea or considered to be uh, the main drivers when the text of the Convention was negotiated. Nor were activities such as bioprospecting for marine genetic resources or ocean geoengineering. One of the central questions of this conference is how the law of the sea has evolved to address challenges which have become apparent since the conclusion of the Convention, and whether this evolution has been a step in the right direction. Similar questions are now more frequently be being asked not only by scientists and legal scholars, but also policymakers. In this regard, I note that the International Relations and Defence Committee of the United Kingdom Parliament recently conducted an inquiry into whether the Convention remained fit for purpose in 2021 and called several distinguished legal scholars to give evidence on issues such as sea level rise, the regulation of access to economic resources, ocean biodiversity, and maritime boundary delimitation. It is generally accepted that the prospects for any renegotiation or amendment of the Convention by means of an intergovernmental conference are rather dim, and that the political conditions which allowed for the adoption of such an ambitious and comprehensive international agreement no longer exist. However, this does not mean that the rules enshrined in the Convention have remained static since it entered into force 27 years ago. In fact, the law of the sea has evolved in numerous ways. First, we have seen the adoption of two implementing agreements. The 1994 agreement relating to the implementation of Part 11 of the Convention dealing with activities in the area makes substantial changes to provisions of the Convention dealing inter alia with decision-making within the International Seabed Authority, te technology transfer limitations on production and the enterprise. The 1995 implementing agreement on straddling fish stocks and highly migratory fish stocks adds substance to the obligations set out in the Convention to cooperate to ensure conservation and promote the objective of the optimum utilization of fisheries resources by providing a framework for cooperation in the co uh, conservation and management of those resources. As you are well aware, efforts are currently underway to finalize the text of an international legally binding instrument under the Convention on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, the so-called BBNJ process. And I look forward to the discussion of some of the issues that have arisen during the course of negotiations on this instrument during tomorrow's panel on biodiversity. 
The Convention also contains several references to generally agreed international rules and standards, in particular with respect to the protection and the preservation of the marine environment. This allows standards which take account of new technologies and new scientific knowledge adopted by international bodies, such as the International Maritime Organization, to be incorporated into the Convention. Finally, international courts and tribunals established under the Convention have a key role to play in interpreting and applying the rules of the Convention to new legal questions. The approach of the Tribunal towards the interpretation of the Convention has been consistent, while at the same time innovative when called for. From its initial case law on the arrest and detention of vessels and crews, the Tribunal has gone on to deal with important aspects of resource exploitation, whether fisheries or the non-living resources of the area, maritime delimitation and the protection and preservation of the marine environment. For example, in its advisory opinion on, uh, concerning issues relating to illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing, the Tribunal clarified that the flag state is under a due diligence obligation to take all necessary measures to ensure compliance uh, and prevent IUU fishing by vessels flying its flag and that the flag state can be held liable if it fails to comply with its due diligence obligations concerning IAU fishing activities. By clarifying the legal obligations of flag states, the tribunal has facilitated the possibility of a, of a future contentious case involving flag state liability for IAU fishing. I note that this advisory opinion was raised in evidence before the International Relations and Defence Committee of the UK Parliament, to which I refer to, as an example of how some of the challenges posed of, uh, to the law of the sea can be addressed. The issuance of advisory opinions on the interpretation of the Convention is certainly one way in which the Tribunal can ensure that the legal framework of the Law of the Sea is adequate to meet the challenges that lie ahead. To date, the Tribunal has not been called on to deal with issues which are the subject of this conference, including climate change, new technologies and marine biodiversity. Nor has the Tribunal had to weigh up conflicting scientific evidence on these issues. The question of how international courts and tribunals should deal with complex scientific evidence and how well equipped they are to do so has generated some debate, particularly in the context of climate change and the law of the sea. The challenge posed by the evaluation of scientific evidence in the apportionment of responsibility is significant. I again look forward to the contributions of the panel on the role of scientific assessment and the law of the sea in this regard. It is also clear that the contribution of the Tribunal to the evolution of the law of the sea will be greatly enhanced by the political will of states. However, I do not think it is naive to consider that we are at the turning point in terms of state action on climate change and I am confident that the Tribunal can play a role by addressing and clarifying some of the key issues involved. Excellencies, distinguished guests, it remains for me to reiterate the Tribunal's appreciation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Korean Society of International Law for hosting and organizing what I am sure will be a most stimulating and informative com conference. I look forward to the interesting discussions ahead, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, President Hoffman, for your wonderful remarks.